around the United States over the last couple of years, looking at the attitudes towards terrorism policy. Unfortunately, my title is somehow did not show up in the transfer between computers, but basically it's called the Bin Laden Effect. Uh, this research is focusing on how terrorism news has influenced public opinion about Muslims, Islam, and uh, terrorism policy in the United States. It's based upon some previous research I started doing in graduate school, and I did my uh, dissertation on looking at the role that uh, media plays in shaping attitudes towards the United States, uh, both in Europe and uh, other uh, in the MENA region, Middle East, North Africa. So. What today's agenda is I just want to briefly talk about some comparative research that I've uh, occur, uh, conducted as well as some of my other colleagues have conducted in this space in looking at the relationship between media and anti-Americanism, but then turn the lens on the United States. There's nothing necessarily unique about the United States. There's no reason to think that media doesn't have influence on public opinion in the United States as well um, about attitudes towards the other party in a sort of perceived conflict. Um, I want to present two studies that I conducted over the last couple of years. One is actually from 2011. Um, it was a natural experiment where we actually had, I happened to have a survey in the field uh, at the time of uh, Bin Laden's death. Uh, and it sort of was an opportunity to see how a spike in terrorism news coverage in the United States then influenced uh, attitudes about Muslims sort of before and after it's sort of the stimulus. So it's a sort of an interesting way to look at how uh, some type of external event influences your survey results, but they turn that into a natural experiment. The other one is actually doing an online experiment with adults in the United States using an online panel to sort of simulate and try to further explore some of the public opinion trends we saw in the uh, large national telephone study that we did. Um, and then some uh, brief comments about the implications uh, for American opinion trends now, especially as they rela relate to ISIS, Syria, and uh, terrorism policy foreign relations. So media international conflict, as I stated, I like to look at two sides of the equation. Um, both how maybe media representations of the United States in foreign media, whether it be European media, whether it be uh, transnational media like Al Jazeera or other Arab transnational media like Al Arabiya, how they influence public opinion uh, towards the United States about foreign policy and anti-Americanism. We also can talk about, well, how does the media then influence the United States? Attitudes towards terrorism, attitudes towards uh, Muslims in Islam, whether there's sort of this perceived conflict between the United States and Islam extremists. So um, that's sort of been my one area of research I've been conducting, oh, since I was a graduate student post 9-11, about 2000. I started graduate school in 2002. So obviously anti-Americanism was of huge interest across many different disciplines in the United States at that time, and the role the media played, especially when uh, politicians pointed to uh, uh, channels like Al Jazeera as promoting anti-Americanism in the Middle East, was of, of, of really interesting comparative concern. So um, there's lots of different studies that have been done over the last few years um, looking at the relationship between uh, media attention, media exposure in different contexts, and attitudes towards the United States and anti-Americanism. Um, I did some work back in 2004, 2008, 2011, uh, looking at both uh, anti-Americanism, um, uh, mostly in Arab countries, and the role that transnational media has played, um, as well as our study from 2008 actually compared Europe, uh, European TV channels, uh, content analysis of European TV channels, and uh, European uh, public opinion data compared to Arab TV channels, content, and Arab public opinion. Um, uh, I did a recent piece in 2011, uh, sort of a condensed looking uh, at public opinion and anti-Americanism uh, across years, for like five years of data across six different countries in the Arab world. We sort of collected several different data sets, did secondary data analysis I'll show you a little bit of, looking at the relationship not only between the role that transnational media played in uh, influencing uh, opinion about the United States, but also national identity. And religious identity. And in, in the Middle East, in Arab countries, you have these sort of competing national identities. You have sort of an Islamic uh, political identity. Um, I can be in Egypt, I can be Egyptian, I can be Muslim, or I can be Arab. And you have these different discourses about political identity that are sort of competing for adherence and mobilization. And so we try to take a look at these three different sort of competing uh, political identities, Arab, 
Muslim and sort of state-based identity and how that interacts with different types of two main communication channels, Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, I also have, um, and it's sort of cut off here for some reason, but there's some other studies. Um, Blade and Linzer uh, use Pew data to take a look at Muslim countries and how, again, uh, elite discourse might influence anti-Americanism when it comes to the role of religiosity and the secular versus religion uh, type of uh, discourse and conflict in Muslim countries. And there's others that have even looked at Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa actually has very high, uh, actually very low anti-Americanism, very high positive attitudes towards the United States. If you have looked at a, a, a range of, of factors, and one of the factors they did identify significantly was how much attention uh, Africans and Sub-Saharan African paid to international news, the more attention they paid, actually the more anti-American they were. So those who paid a lot of attention to news within Sub-Saharan Africa actually had a, a less favorable opinion of the United States compared to uh, Sub-Saharan Africans who did that. So the media can play different types of roles. So to give you an example of some anti-American data, um, this is a survey analysis from uh, five years of data. Uh, the countries are Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Morocco, Lebanon, United Arab uh, Emirates. And for this analysis, we looked at Muslims uh, uh, only. Uh, Christian Arabs from Egypt were excluded from the analysis um, because we were looking at sort of these competing Islamic, Arab, and state-based identities. And our total end was about 19,000. Um, because of the small number of countries, we actually didn't do a multi-level analysis. Um, that we did take into account, uh, put in some country-level controls. So, oh, again, it's, I think there's some inter there's um, some issues between. I think our our uh, moving from our different versions of PowerPoint here. The slide isn't how it is originally. So, I apologize for that. Some of these slides might be slightly messed up because we move from different my version of PowerPoint to your version of PowerPoint, so I apologize. But basically what I did, a, we did a pro, we, my partner and I, did a probate regression and we looked at unfavorable and unfavorable opinions of the U.S., exposure to either Al Jazeera, which tends to have a, a more of an anti-American bent into its news frames, compared to Al Arabiya, which is actually a Saudi uh, channel that was started um, uh, as a competitor to Al Jazeera and has close ties to the uh, uh, Saudi uh, regime, as well as seen as more friendly towards the United States. For example, the very first interview, media interview, that uh, President Obama did after his election, after his inauguration in 2009, was not with a U.S. channel, it was with Al Arabiya to speak to the, to the Islamic world. So they tend to have a more friendlier framing of U.S. relations and U.S. politics compared to Al Jazeera. Right? So we're going to compare how these two different channels that have often different frames, different types of media content when it comes to the United States, also interact with different sort of nationalist or political identities in shaping attitudes with the United States. So hopefully this works. Um, here's our regression analysis. Again, it's a little messed up. But what you can see here is that um, predicting anti-American sentiment, uh, Muslim identity, which is the top one, was by far the more uh, uh, stronger your political Islamic identity, and Muslim identity from a political viewpoint, not simply being Muslim, but uh, basically political Islam, had a uh, greater anti-American sentiment. Um, as compared to, for example, um, having a national identity, right, saying I'm Egyptian or I'm Jordanian rather than Arab or Muslim is my most important political identity, you tend to have actually, you're less likely to be anti-American. You have more favorable attitudes towards the United States if you have a state-based identity versus sort of a transnational religious-based identity. Um, we also saw um, that uh, when we took a look at some interactions, we saw that exposure to either Al Jazeera or Al Arabiya had sort of different effects depending on your sort of pre-existing identification. That the effects of the media were contingent all right, were moderated by the strength, uh, what type of identity you sort of put first and foremost as your political identity, whether I identify first and foremost as an Arab versus first and foremost as an Egyptian or first and foremost as a Muslim, politically. This is not good. Okay, so my figures are a little messed up here, unfortunately. Um, so... <laughs> The text explains what was going to show you in a nice animated figure. 
But um, higher reliance on Al Jazeera increased the predicted probability of an unfavorable opinion among Arab identifiers. So what we found was that if you had a strong Muslim identity, it doesn't matter which channel you watch. It doesn't matter what information you're exposed to. All right? You had a very negative opinion in the United States. However, if you had an Arab identity, political identity, you were persuadable, for example. You moved, as well as a national identity. They are open to informational effects. Right? So the idea is that often that's the thing about media, whether it's social media, mass media, it's contingent. Uh, you know, uh, John Zoller said that you know, the uh, public opinion is a marriage of predisposition and information. Right? So not everyone is open to informational effects. Sometimes it's trying to figure out who are, who are not. Right? And so, uh, my beautiful figures. Um, <laughs> so, um, higher reliance on Al Arabiya, however, decreased predictive probability of an unfavorable opinion uh, by 8%. All right, so it basically, you saw the, the percentage of, of, of Arab identifiers that were uh, uh, expressed an unfavorable opinion in the United States went down by 8 percentage points uh, between like a high, low level of uh, view of uh, Al Arabi exposure and a high level of Al Arabi exposure. So the conclusion here, as our conclusions are, exposure to Al Jazeera increases unfavorable opinions among the U.S., among Arab identifiers, but decreases unfavorable opinion among national identifiers. Right? Um, exposure to Al Arabiya decreases unfavorable opinion of the U.S. among Arab identifiers. So the question is, you see different Arab identifiers or national identifiers more open to informational effects. Those who say that I first and foremost identify as a Muslim politically, uh, whether I'm Jordanian, whether I'm Egyptian, whether I'm Lebanese, those individuals are not open to informational effects from Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya. All right? It was the other sort of uh, political-based identities. So the question is, how are there media effects going in the United States when it comes to how people feel about Muslims and what are the consequences for terrorism policy or anti-terrorism policy? Right? So um, media in the United States, uh, for me, when it comes to Muslims, is really interesting. Compared to Russia, for example, we have a much larger Muslim population of other countries in Europe. Less than 1% of the population in the United States is Muslim. Um, which is, means that the media plays an outsized role in influencing attitudes towards Muslims and Muslim Americans. Um, there's little social interaction uh, between Muslims and non-Muslims. Um, only about, uh, if you ask people uh, some basic knowledge questions about Islam, um, just very basic things like what day of the week do, they con uh, do Muslims congregate for prayer, um, what is the name of their holy book, things like that. Only about 15% of the population in the United States have any sort of basic knowledge of Islam. And only about 15% say they actually interact with a Muslim on a regular basis or less. Right? Um, partly it's because of immigration patterns, partly because of geography patterns, a whole range of self-selection bias. And if you ask people what do they base their opinion of Muslims on or Islam on, a plurality say that media is a primary source of information about Islam compared to 18% who say personal experience. Um, actually, the, the second most uh, cited uh, influence on people's opinion is either media or their religious beliefs. That's what they base their opinion of Muslims on, right? rather than actual interpersonal uh, personal experience. So uh, from a, in a theoretical perspective, we call this media dependency. When you're highly dependent upon the media for things which are socially, fiscally, temporally distant. Right? They're psychologically distant, and thus you're dependent upon the media for information, to form opinions about that particular object or people in this case. Um, if you look at the evolution of news, of terrorism news, and the role of how terrorism has been portrayed in American media, how Muslims and Islam have been portrayed in American media, it's evolved since 9-11. Um, uh, primarily depictions of Muslims and terrorism was traditionally in movies, action movies. You had uh, the idea sometimes of these you know, you know, and often in stereotypical ways of Palestinian terrorists, Arab terrorists, Muslim terrorists, and very stereotypical, non-realistic um, uh, portrayals of Muslim populations, either domestic or internationally. Um, p uh, often you had writers using this called a, a toolkit of stereotypes when it comes to sort of how they would write an Arab or, or Muslim character in, uh, in media. 
Um, and then basically, often this was picked up in news and journalism, especially after 9 11. You had a migration of depictions of terrorism and Islam from entertainment to news, um, local news, TV news, which, much like in Russia, is still the dominant, even with the growth of the internet, 90% of Americans are the, on the internet. Uh, we have a large percentage using social media. If you still do surveys today and you take a look at what's the number one news source in the United States, it's your local news. All right? That's plurality of Americans to rely on their local TV news, which has a horrible quality, I can tell you, as their primary source of information. So what you actually see is sort of some meta-narratives and how journalism and media covers uh, 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 terrorism in the United States, where, um, no offense, up until the 1990s, often it came to international relations, the media in the United States had this bias to cover international relations always through this red lens of what some journalists call the red menace, right, of American-Soviet relations. And that the Soviet Union was somehow of this sort of distant other in which represented everything the United States wasn't, you know, and anything that happened internationally in American news, whether it was related to relationships with the Soviet Union or not, was always portrayed in the lens of the Cold War. It was hard to get outside that. That was sort of a a meta-narrative that infiltrated a lot of international news and political news in the United States. And some uh, uh, journalists and, and, and scholars have argued that meta-narrative has switched from the idea of the red menace with the fall of the Soviet Union and, and after the 90s to the idea of the green menace, that Islam or Islamic extremism is this sort of imagined other that sort of a lot of news coverage, whether it's terrorism coverage or international relations coverage, always takes the lens of Islamic terrorism, even when it's not directly related. And this has sort of this idea of this sort of the Huntington, you know, Samuel Huntington, uh, American scholars, clash of civilizations between sort of the West and Islam, uh, often the media take that perspective. That often not focusing on differences in politics, differences in economics, they focus on difference in values, difference in religion, rather than focusing on actual political or economic or other types of differences. You actually, quite frankly, you see some of that also when it comes to Russian-American relations in media from probably both sides uh, of the ocean in terms of how often uh, uh, disagreements are portrayed. It's much easier to focus on value differences than actually complex uh, economic or political differences between countries. Um, you have chronic news coverage of war in Islamic countries, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq. Um, TV news tends to be, I mean, every night, you know, casualties. And it still continues now, right? Um, especially with ISIS in, in Syria and in Iraq. Um, TV news compared to other types of news is known, especially, and especially TV terrorism news, conflict, it's very evocative imagery, uh, very emotionally, um, it often amplifies threat. There's all types of literature that talks about the role that TV news and terrorism news, how it impacts us psych psychologically, how it impacts us even physically in terms of our level of emotional arousal, physical arousal when we watch uh, conflict-oriented news. So this actually influences how we process information, our, our fear responses, and how we might view um, the participants in the conflict and what we might take away from it. Um, news generally in the United States generally links Islam with terrorism. Just in general, it's become very synonymous in a lot of the reporting. Even though what you can't see here is sort of cut off, uh, domestic deaths from terrorism um, are primarily from right-wing um, uh, groups like uh, neo-Nazis or uh, uh, KKK skinhead racial racial groups, white white supremacists. Um, deaths in the United States from terrorist acts are two to one in favor of white-wing groups over any type of jihadi or Islamic group. So even though the threat is greater from often right-wing or neo-Nazi type groups. Often, it's the Islamic terrorist threat that is focused upon in American media. Okay, so enough of, uh, there's a few, some public opinion data. For example, in 2002, uh, about a quarter of Americans thought that there was sort of this clash of civilizations type of uh, perspective uh, between, and, and now in two, and, and 10 years later, it was almost double that. All right, uh, same thing in 2002, about a quarter agree that Islam was more likely to others encourage violence about 12 years later, uh, a double that as well. So in terms of the perceived threat of, from Islam, even though Muslims are less than 1% of our population, the threat has uh, rather substantially increased. And it's not based upon social interaction. It's not based upon the number of deaths 
from Islamic terrorism, what is this based on? Where, is this, where are these, where are these uh, opinions coming from? Right. Um, uh, 9 11 changed things. So you can see is the number of hate crimes targeting Muslims prior to 2001. Right? You saw a spike in 2001, and since 2001, it's been more than double, or five times greater post 9 11. So the number of hate crimes uh, is actually higher, five times greater now than it was prior to 2001 uh, in the United States towards Muslims. Um, if you look at, okay, <laughs> if you look at this, my feeling thermometer, where there are no feelings. Um, <laughs> lack of feeling thermometer, it's a new scale. How, how do you not feel? Um, so American feelings in comparison, uh, what I was going to show you is that um, when it comes to Jews, Catholics, uh, Evangelical Christians, about two-thirds of Americans have positive feelings. That, that's the mean score on a feeling thermometer scale from zero to 100. For Muslims, they're the least liked religious group, they're, not tired. they're even more least liked than atheists, which is saying something about the same. So it's 40% only, so basically the mean score for Muslims is at, is at 40, all right? The, um, I can sort of show that around, right? But, and so it goes from Muslims to, to, to uh, Catholics. Here. Right, so that's uh, your scale here, so I can show it here too. So, can I just go like that? Oh, there I can go. Oh, there I go to the next one. Let's see if the next one works. It'll be like, okay. Oh, this shows up. So, also some additional poll. For example, um, I might need this again if we come up with some additional. Okay. So, um, supportive of U.S. Only a half, only about half of Americans believe that American Muslims are supportive of the U.S. But a third think they're too extreme. About a quarter think they're sympathetic to Al-Qaeda. Um, majority of Americans support hearings. Uh, investigations of, of terrorism and extremity among our, our, our Congress. And about a third believe that extremism of the Muslim American community is actually increasing. These are all different poll results. This is a canceled TV show they tried for a little bit called All American Muslim. Unfortunately, then it created a bunch of back, uh, uh, pushback where a lot of different uh, major companies refused to advertise on this TV show because they thought it was somehow uh, controversial. Um, you've had a lot of mobilization against mosques. Uh, whenever a new mosque is built, um, you have a lot of community groups mobilizing against it. There's been vandalization, burning mosques. Um, seven states have worried about anti-Sharia legislation. So even again, even though Muslims are less than 1% of the population, there's somehow some concern that somehow we're going to start living under Sharia law, um, even though there's no chance that actually happening uh, in any political way. Um, uh, another dozen forms some sort of anti-Sharia type laws under consideration, though they've actually had to repeal some of them because sometimes when they pass a, 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 a anti some type of religious law, they find there are boomerang effects where it actually actually impacts other religions other than Islam. Um, so, on my interest is and and based upon some of the um, research focusing on crime and race in the United States, is how does the increasing accessibility of negative stereotypes about minorities or outgroups in conflict. Whether it's Americans in um, maybe Arab media, uh, for example, or whether it's Muslims in American media, right? How does representations of these groups in conflict with each other, these over-representations, this, uh, this great focus on conflict, um, influence stereotypes about each other? Um, how does it uh, increase threat or fear uh, perceptions, especially through emotionally arousing cues that you see in this conflict type of media content. Exaggerated risk and overrepresentation. If you are always, for example, and there's a lot of research on African Americans and crime, how local TV news and the way they talk about crime always makes Americans think that it's a black, per per uh, a black uh, criminal versus, you know, again, African Americans are only 12, 13 percent of the population where you know, most criminals are white just because we're the uh, lar largest racial group in the United States. But this overrepresentation, where there's a lot of research on that TV news has made people think that there's a, in their minds, mentally, when you say African American, you think criminal. When you say criminal, more importantly, you automatically think African American with no, inf no other information. It primes, activates negative uh, stereotypes and feelings towards African Americans just talking about crime as a subject because of this uh, over-representation and linkage in news. 
right? And there's lots of studies. And then it influences policy, influences policy preferences about the death penalty, policy anti-crime policy, so it has a lot of policy preferences. So, um, and then also this time I uh, promote sort of authoritarian er attitudes when it comes to civil liberty issues or democratic rights or human rights, my influence. So, um, uh, from a theoretical perspective, from social psychology, I'm not sure how many of you have a social psych background, though I do comparative work, I often view it through a lens of social psychology. Um, there's this, this theory called intergroup threat theory that was developed in the United States, often looking at racial groups, but it can be expanded to look at any type of group conflict, whether it be defined based upon race, ethnicity, religion, or whatever it may be, and that negative stereotypes increase perceived threat and willingness to express prejudice, or the willingness to somehow um, restrict the rights or target that out group, right? Um, and that the idea is that media might, you know, from a media psychology perspective, media is a source of these stereotypes, and constant uh, exposure, or exposure over time, make, make these threats, these stereotypes, chronically accessible, that they are basically easily retrieved under a wide range of circumstances, that they don't actually, to the point where they don't need, they become chronically and linked to certain mental constructs. So whether it's crime and African American, or what we're interested in these couple studies is terrorism and Islam. All right, the idea is how have threat perceptions, stereotypes become chronically accessible, uh, associated with sort of terrorism and terrorism policy, and Muslim or Islam in the American media, and what the consequences of that. Because what I like to do is then go back and sort of replicate some of this, looking at other contexts like in Arab or Armenia countries as well, right, from comparative people. So our study one was what we call a natural experiment, um, and I'll talk more about, about that. So that was uh, taking some polling data we had collected, and going back and analyzing it, and seeing we hadn't planned this, but because of uh, external events, it might influence our results because it of uh, Bin Laden's death, so it was an opportunity to sort of in a very sort of with a high level of both internal and external validity look to see how this actual event influenced public opinion. And then the other one was an online experiment to sort of test some of the mechanisms to test sort of intergroup theory experimentally to see whether we can pick up um, uh, similar results to what we found in the natural experiment. So the death of Bin Laden happened in 2011. Uh, about uh, over four years ago, um, on that Sunday, uh, President Obama in the evening announced the death of Bin Laden. You had like 30 million uh, cable viewers, like 9 million alone on CNN, watch that announcement. And we actually had a poll in the field at that very time, a telephone poll uh, that was in the field for about six weeks, collecting data on attitudes towards terrorism policy, attitudes towards Muslims, media use all the types of things I've been talking about we're interested in, we just happen to have a poll in the field at the time. So, what happened was, okay, I might need that again. Um, there was a huge spike in TV news where in the, in the basically sort of 10 days after Bin Laden's death, 90, 90%, oops, it, it went dark. Oh, oh. sorry. 90, all I have to say is 90% of all TV news in the United States was about Bin Laden and terrorism. That's all they talked about. And some days, 90% of everything in 24-hour cable news, terrorism, Bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, 9-11. That's all they talked about. So we can basically see before that, there was almost no mention of terrorism news. That's the natural experiment. That's the stimulus. That Bin Laden died, there was no mention, no media conversation about terrorism. Bin Laden died, bam, 90% of it is about terrorism in the media, right? So we can compare, okay, how people, their attitudes, especially about among those who have a high level of television exposure, who watch TV news, what their attitudes were before and after Bin Laden's death. Controlling for uh, differences in demographics and other variables, all right? And this is just going to show you some additional poll data to show you that uh, how the role of TV news, for example, when you ask people, what was your top source for news about Bin Laden after his death, three quarters of Americans said TV. Right, and uh, obviously went up the, the older you were. And this is across cable, what we call cable TV, our network TV like CNN, network TV, our major broadcasters, and then local news, we have local broadcasters. All right. um, and there was a huge interest and in, in, in threat. Like what they're interested in was the chance of a terror attack and retaliation. 
uh, activated threat perceptions. What they were knowing is, yes, we killed bin Laden, but are we going to be attacked again by Al-Qaeda? All right, so there was a, a huge increase in threat perceptions post 9-11 and worry about that. Right. And that's what the kind of news they were searching for, interesting. Right. So we, um, we had a national telephone survey. We collected about 500 surveys before bin Laden's death. We had, um, and this happened in our data collection, about 338 interviews after bin Laden's death. Um, was conducted in a joint, we, in, in, uh, I'm not sure how in Russia this is, but in the United States, our, uh, many of our major universities have their own survey centers, where they do telephone surveys or web surveys, and this was a collaboration between myself and two survey centers, one at Cornell University, one at the uh, University of New Hampshire, both have survey centers. 18% um, uh, of the respondents, and this is about four years ago, it's not up about 40 or 50% of the respondents usually when we do a telephone polls or cell phone only. That time landline, it, cell phones hadn't, are not quite as high as they are now, but about 20% were cell phone only, we had a decent response rate by, uh, by our standards. So I have a couple of hypotheses, and what I'm going to show you is sort of what we call a moderated median model. It's a statistical model, I apologize for those who are not into stats. But it's a model sort of, sort of look at, okay, how does opinions before and after the line of death compare, and how do this moderated um, by uh, uh, the death and TV news? What's the interaction between Bin Laden's death and exposure to TV news? So we, we hypothesize that TV news moderates the relationship between Bin Laden's death and negative stereotype endorsement of Muslims. What we're saying is that stereotypes, negative stereotypes about Muslims will only go up after Bin Laden's death among those who are watching a high level of TV news, because that's basically where you'll, this information will be primed from. That's the stimulus, right? This is increased coverage about terrorism news. is going to influence people's uh, uh, threat perceptions about Islam and then their policy attitudes. And the endorsement of negative stereotypes about Muslims mediates the relationship between Bin Laden's death and support restricting Muslim civil liberties, or in this case, uh, or anti-terrorism policies, and do other types of news use increased negative stereotype endorsement about Muslims after Bin Laden's death? We looked to see if there's any other types of news that did it. None did, actually. So this is something called a conditional process model. It's using a bunch of SPSS macros um, that does bootstrapping. It sort of simulates a structural equation model, which is a type of statistical analysis. Our, um, our, our dependent variables or stereotypes about Muslims as well as public opinion about targeted anti-terrorism policies. So anti-terrorism policies that targeted Muslims specifically. We had TV news use, Bin Laden's death, you can't see the rest. We have a whole range of controls. And what we really want to make sure is that one reason you put a controls in and we actually look for bias, you wanted to make sure that the people who answered the survey before Bin Laden's death were not somehow uh, demographically or psychologically different from the people who happened to answer the survey after Bin Laden's death. Because if they're different, well, that might explain the differences in your results. If you control for that, well, then the differences you see before and after most likely are, you know, theoretically and statistically from this natural experiment. All right? and, so the, and so I checked. We did an analysis. We checked to see whether the demographics, uh, age, education, gender, uh, media uh, use, right, uh, media use patterns, were the people who answered the survey, were they somehow different? The people who answered the survey uh, did the survey before Bin Laden's death compared to people who did it, and they were not. So the, it was all things being equal, we didn't see it a bias that certain people suddenly decided to do the survey on this topic after Bin Laden's death. They were they were shared the same characteristics in terms of age, education, gender, use patterns, etc. Right. So um, you can't see this. Um, but can I borrow this? Because this is an important graph. We can. You can, but unfortunately our audience is uh, a little out of luck. Um, oops. Okay, uh, let's turn it this way. Okay. So as I'm modeling here, I feel like Vanna White, uh, stereotype <laughs> endorsement and threat, uh, what you see here is that the blue line, the blue is prior to Bin Laden's death, the red is after his death, and what you find is that uh, statistically, after Bin Laden's death, all right, um, there was a significant increase in stereotype endorsement among only people who watched a lot of TV news, right, cable and broadcast news. Um, there was no significant effects 
um, at low or, or, or moderate or average levels of TV use, but those who watch a lot of TV use, all right, in general, um, their negative star types increased, controlling for uh, several other factors. And then, this is what we call a process model. We call it moderated mediation because what we found, the next one shows up, let's see. <gasps> okay. <laughs> it's like each, 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 each slide is a nice surprise. Okay. So what we find is that Bin Laden's death occurred. There was an increase in negative stereotype endorsement among high TV users that moderated the relationship. And the negative stereotype endorsement influenced people's support for targeted anti-terrorism policy. So there was an, what we call an indirect effect between Bin Laden's death and public opinion through negative stereotype endorsement. And that this indirect effect, though, was moderated or partly contingent about how much TV news you watched. That's the idea of a, moder uh, a moderate mediated results. And so you can calculate the total indirect effects bootstrapping all right, and calculating actual uh, confidence intervals to see if it's a significant indirect effect. And it was, these are unstandardized coefficients. So at high TV news exposure, there's an indirect effect on poli uh, anti targeted uh, anti-terrorism policies, all right, targeting Muslims. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that Bin Laden's death, ironically, instead of people making people feel safer, Bin Laden's death, and actually maybe reducing negative stereotypes about Muslims, Bin Laden's death actually increased negative stereotypes of Muslims because it basically chronic the media helped chronically prime these stereotypes that then influence people to be even more restrictive uh, in targeting Muslims when it comes to anti-terrorism policies. So among heavy TV users, terrorism news increased endorsement of inter intergroup threat stereotypes, partial mediation, because as you can see, there's still a direct effect that um, television news use above and beyond influencing negative stereotype endorsement also, it didn't matter. Um, ter negative stereotypes about Muslims only partially mediated the relationship between television news use and support for a targeted anti-terrorism policy. So it was a partial mediation. Um, uh, intergroup threat increased public support for restricting Muslim American civil liberties. Similarly, patterns did not exist for other forms of media use. We checked newspaper, looked at radio. It was really only TV news. And that is, makes sense because it is the primary source of news for most Americans. Um, and it was the most evocative, imagery-wise, it has the higher propor highest proportion of terrorism news, etc. So that makes sense. All right. So, one of the questions is, okay, that's sort of an instant. So is this something that happens just ever so often? Is it an acute phenomenon? Does this happen only, do, do negative stereotypes about Muslims only occur when we have a high level of terrorism news? And then when terrorism news goes down, then people then don't make that link. Um, or are there consequences for constant priming? If you're always talking about terrorism and Islam, the only time you talk about Muslims, the only time you talk about Muslims in U.S. media is in the context of terrorism 90% of the time, right? And, and the issue is not whether most terrorists are Muslims. The issue becomes, are most Muslims terrorists? That's the linkage that you're concerned about in people's heads. Right? And so drawing upon, again, an extensive amount of literature looking at the relationship between crime and race in the United States, as unfortunately exhibited over the last year and a half by Black Lives Matter, the riots in Ferguson, uh, problems in New York City. It's been a huge issue of this racial stereotyping, racial profiling in crime in the United States. And, and, and possible even how uh, police might have stereotypes about, uh, based upon right, white policemen have stereotypes. And actually black policemen too have stereotypes about African Americans and might influence how they treat African American suspects or you know, shoot first, ask questions later, etc. It's been a huge debate in the United States if you've been paying attention. Um, you can think about the same thing when terrorism, terrorism policy and, and, and uh, religion. So they did some interesting studies where they would uh, create sort of fake local TV news and they would show, they have three conditions. One would be um, a white criminal, one would be an African American criminal, and then they would show like this person, uh, they caught the suspect, um, and they would show just like a profile, like no cues about race whatsoever. And they found that people who actually just watch crime news when there was no cues about race of the criminal or identity of the criminal at all, 
after watching the crime news, their attitude, their negative attitudes towards African Americans went up. So the no mention of African Americans at all in the news, all right, their attitudes, their support for the death penalty, um, their negative stereotypes of African Americans were activated in these experiments they ran. And the reason they said, and they went back and they said, well, it's because of the overrepresentation of African Americans in crime, in new crime news. It wasn't that African Americans were conducting the majority of the crimes, just having that crime news focus on crimes, and they would also focus on the African American suspects, all right, or criminals. So they said, okay, this is interesting. Let's try to replicate this, but instead of being African American, being Muslim, instead of crime, being terrorists. And the experiment, maybe that sort of links to what we were seeing about how news was activating stereotypes in our bin Laden uh, death uh, study. So we did, uh, so what we hypothesized is that prior attention terrorism news, high exposure terrorism news, makes these associations between Islam and terrorism chronically accessible in your head easily retrievable, even when not explicitly primed, right? And this moderates relationship between exposure to a story about unidentified terrorists, I don't Muslim, mention Muslims at all, uh, and intergroup threat from Muslims, which in turn then influences, just like we saw with the Bin Laden study, how stereotypes and influence terrorism policy attitudes, would it do the same thing, influence terrorism policy attitudes, all right? Um, and then, um, uh, uh, and then we asked, okay, what about non-terrorism stories? So we actually had a story in, um, when we look at intergroup threat theory, there's two types of threats. There's the realistic threat, the physical threat of a group, and there's the sort of the social threat of a group. It's like, so it, do they threaten your values, your way of life, because they're somehow different uh, ethnically, nationally, uh, morally, value-wise, so there's like value-based threat versus physical threat. So we wanted to see whether you, we saw the same pattern of value-based threat so as, as sort of a research question. So we had a two-wave online experiment with adults that recruited. We, they, get, they get paid like a dollar per survey through this commercial panel. So it costs about five dollars per person to do. Um, we had uh, 800 people come online and do a pre-test questionnaire, right, recruit adults. And we use quota sampling, so the adult sample mimic the national sort of demographic differences in terms of race, education, gender, employment of the American population. So it's a non-probability sample using quota sampling. To at least as an experiment, we wanted to increase uh, the heterogeneity of the sample to have a wide range of people in terms of their religious backgrounds, ide ide ideological backgrounds, ethnic, racial, education backgrounds. Um, and then, so it was very, uh, you can't maybe see the statistics, but you know, it was 55% male, 80% white. It was actually a pretty heterogeneous, diverse background. And basically, people filled out this pretest questionnaire about their attitudes towards terrorism policy, attitudes towards uh, Muslims, um, uh, stereotypes, media use, a whole range of questions. Five weeks later, the reason that you split up, you don't want to prime people. If you ask people questions about a topic, whether it be terrorism or anti-Americanism or media, you might prime them then to, to view your stimulus in a certain way from an experimental way, uh, perspective and then answer your questions where it sort of confounds your results. But by having even, sometimes some people might wait a day or two days and so the prime might go that We were being very conservative. We waited five weeks. So we got half, uh, about, we recruited about half, so you do 800 in a pre-test of one of these online volunteer panels. You might get half to come back that much longer, five weeks longer, and do your panel. I actually have, a, I actually have done some of this in Turkey, too. We got about 50%. And I'm actually thinking about doing this next year in Russia as well, some type of design, actually, because it's, it's about the same cost, about five, six dollars per person to do an online experiment in Russia as in the United States, actually. Um, so, um, we had four conditions, experimental conditions. A, new, a fake news story about an identified Islamic terrorist, um, a news story about unidentified terrorists, a news story about Sharia law, a symbolic threat, right? Like, and as I said, Sharia law has been an issue that a lot of Republicans have mobilized in certain states, this idea that somehow 1% of the population is going to institute Sharia law in the United States. And then no, a control, there was no story. We just asked people who did the test at time one to simply redo the same questionnaire at time two. All right. And this is what we found. Oh, this is an example. So we, we said this is a fake news story, so we're doing a journalism project, we're from a journalism school, we're going to read this story, uh, we're doing a project on how to present news online, like digital journalism project. Uh, we have some news stories for you to read. 
read it, tell us what you think of the layout, if it's too long, all right? We didn't want them to actually think about what we're trying to do here. And so here's one story. Again, we just simply, the, it's the exact same story. We just, in, what we simply did is insert the word Islamic in front of terrorist in certain places. And we changed the, the mug shots, where it's unidentified. So it has this story, has no cues about Islam or ethnicity or the identity of the terrorist at all. The other one does. All right. And so we wanted to see it, it. And so the question is not whether this story generates stereotypes. The question is whether this story, the story that has the unidentified subjects, generates stereotypes. That's the question. That's what we can compare. So it's the unidentified condition that we're most interested in. All right. So our theoretical variables, and again, it's a little cut off here. We have waves. So we actually, the great thing is not only this is a between subject, all right, we have a lot of power here. Because not only a between subject design, it's a within subject design. Because we have multiple measures from the same people at multiple times. So in many ways, people from time one are acting as their own control, as well as the control condition from a social psychological perspective. We have um, uh, our different conditions. We have media use. We have demographics, uh, ideology, religion, all kinds of controls, which are unfortunately cut off here, that we included to control for any spurious effects between our conditions. Even though we had random assignment. So people were randomly assigned to this condition. This is like a normal laboratory experiment. All right. And this doesn't work either. Can I borrow your... Thank you, sir, for being so, so nice. So, um, so when you look at conditions, time, media, attention, what we found here, which is highlighted in this box, yet somehow it's not <laughs> popping out, is that um, the only, what we found was among the unidentified terrorist condition, which again is hard to see here, you saw a significant increase of people who paid a lot of attention to terrorism news. You saw uh, they had much higher stereotype endorsement of, uh, towards Muslims all right, than people uh, uh, with uh, low to moderate previous exposure to terrorism news among the unidentified condition. So we saw, we found evidence for what we call for the unidentified perpetrator effect. Is that people, people who watch a lot of terrorism news, they said at time one, prior to seeing this five weeks before, we we'll asked them how often do you watch news about terrorism and crime, basically, because it can be framed either way in the United States as terrorism or crime. Those people watch a lot of news about terrorism and crime, when they read a story about terrorists with no mention of Muslims, they have a higher uh, 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 negative opinion of Muslims and Muslim stereotypes after reading that story than they did five weeks ago, and compared to others who read no story. Okay? And this is, again, is a, what we call, oh, this is a little messy here, not as clean as the other one, but this is a moderated, mediated model where we ran the same model that we did the Bin Laden study. So the nice thing is taking our model from public opinion data and fitting it to our survey data and running it again. Find the same types of relationships that uh, identify terrorism story, all right, influence negative stereotype endorsement, which in then increased and it had indirect effects, right, um, for uh, based upon your prior attention to terrorism news. Right? So a similar type of pattern that we found with the first study. So there's some convergent validity here between study one and study two. So in summary, prior attention to terrorism news amplified intergroup threat among those exposed to generic terrorism news, but not to other conditions. So the um, where our research question was, what about social threat, like the values-oriented threat compared to physical threat? All right, and we found that values threat did not did not do anything. So prior terrorism news did not amplify stereotypes among those who watched the who read the values threat story. It was really about the the terrorism story. Um, there was again partial mediation, intergroup threat, increased support for targeted anti-Semitic policies, and this is consistent with our previous work, not from the Bin Laden study, but also the work on crime and stereotypes about African Americans. Very similar so social psychological processes. Okay. Um, and so it suggests that there might be sort of this chronic accessibility, chronic link in people's heads between terrorism and Muslims. So this is a John Dewey, is a famous sort of American philosopher and educator, the Dewey Decimal System and whatnot. Um, so this is a classic quote from 1916. The idea is when we don't think about things, right, the things that we take for granted without inquiry or reflection, like the chronic accessibility of stereotypes, right, that are just happen unconsciously. 
right, when we're exposed to certain stimulus, are just the things that determine our conscious thinking and decode our conclusions, right? Sort of a basic quote. That's what I think about when I think about not only stereotypes about Muslims, but maybe stereotypes about Russians, stereotypes of other groups that might be in conflict. Same thing with maybe Russians have stereotypes about Americans. Uh, Arabs have stereotypes about Americans. So when you talk about the role that media might play when you have very sort of, you know, most Russians maybe have never met an American, right? In general, maybe in Moscow that may be different, but same thing with Americans have never met a Russian, right? So the idea is that when you have these very distant groups and you're in conflict or disagreement in some way, and you're relying upon the media for information, you're dependent upon the media, the media plays an outsized role in shaping your attitudes and perceptions that even you don't recall necessarily consciously about that other group. And that, what are the consequences of that, both short term for policy, but also long term if you're trying to resolve a conflict, right? But people have sort of these ingrained, chronically accessible negative attitudes about the other party to the conflict, right? based upon their media use patterns. Right? Um, some theoretical implications, generalizability, expansive boundary conditions of work on news and chronic accessibility of negative stereotypes, perceived out groups of, it expands it beyond crime and African Americans, think about more international context, I think. And international, the role that media might play in international conflict more broadly from a social psychological perspective, right? Um, is the integration of intergroup threat theory with media effects. Typically, inter, uh, intergroup threat theory has really focused on, on the media role uh, on this case. Um, to examine opinion formation and public opinion as well. Um, so, to, just to sort of wrap up here, the question is, um, have Muslims and terrorists become synonymous with American minds? I think it has to a degree. Um, what are the consequences of that? Um, this goes beyond content studies. There's been a lot of content studies, but to understand you have the content of the media, but you need to link it up to the effects of the media, and vice versa. To understand the effects of the media, you need to look at the content of the media, right? This, there's been a lot of focus on content studies of terrorism in the Islamic United States, but not a lot of effects-based research, social psychological comparative research. And so how do how does, and it's sort of caught off here, how do news about old threats like Al-Qaeda and bin Laden influence perceive, uh, perceptions about new threats like ISIS in Syria? Sort of I want to wrap up here. Okay, so some of this shows up. So as you can see, um, public support for a U.S. military campaign against Islamic militants in Iran and Syria, as news coverage has picked up, quite frankly, has increased from about half of Americans to about two-thirds of Americans over, the, over a period of a year. All right, so there's a, been an increase in approval for the American targeting ISIS and its involvement in Syria and Iraq um, compared to uh, a, a, a less disapproval. And if you could hand me your uh, thing again, <laughs> sorry, it's the last slide, so. This one's a little messy out of the way. Mm -hmm. Oh, because there's an animation, there's like some cool animation. Oh, and awesome. I, that's no longer a possibility here. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, about half of Americans over, if you ask people on a survey how closely are you paying attention to news about Syrian ISIS, about half Americans say they're paying very close or very close attention to news about what's going on there, so there's a high level of interest. And, ten and again, primarily TV news. Cable, 24-hour access, CNN, Fox, MSNBC um, are uh, main. Uh, most of Americans actually, although I watch cable news, most Americans, if it's not local news, the second biggest source of news is our half an hour national broadcast from 6 to 6.30 at night, right? About 25 million Americans watch those every night. Um, so. Oh, uh, so they're paying close attention, and then basically what you see is a flip where between September 2015 and August 2015, the, the percentage of Americans that would support ground troops, actually instead of just, just, uh, instead of just uh, airplanes and bombing, like Russia has started recently, so now we're both uh, involved in Syria, um, though neither, uh, neither country has ground troops actually fighting on the ground in Syria to date. The number of Americans that would support ground troops in Iraq and Syria has, has increased with now it's the majority of Americans. So they were the minority at 38% a year ago, and now they're, they're the majority at 52%. All right? um, also, um, you ask, uh, and I sort of wanted to compare Russia to, um, if you ask Americans what's the greatest long-term threat to the United States, like we're talking about long-term threat, you know, big threat to the United States. A third of them say ISIS, 
is our biggest threat. Uh, the, you know, and then I think it was Iran. I think I think China is second at 26 percent, and you'll be happy to know that Russia is down there around nine percent. So I'm sorry, guys. ISIS beat you out. Um, so that's that's sort of the you know interesting thing, and that's again a function of media coverage. Why is ISIS such a threat to the long term long term threat to the United States? This group, which is you know maybe 20, 30 thousand fighters. Located in Syria, yes, they have a very good social media strategy, which gets lots of views, you know, and a lot of attention in the United States. Yes, they've done some high-profile executions. They've inspired some attacks in, in, in Europe and elsewhere. But really, as compared to maybe other global conflicts or possible global competitors, ISIS as a potential threat, at least in the minds of Americans, seems outsized compared to the reality. And I think that's partly driven by both the chronic, the previous chronic accessibility of terrorism and stereotypes going back to 2001, as well as current media coverage. And I'll conclude there. Thank you very much. Thank you. So questions, please, comments. I would love them. Yeah, we have a moderator from St. Petersburg. So okay, thank you. Uh, so, please, questions. Uh, we have a question in St. Petersburg as well. Yeah, it's... Um, perhaps more like a comment, but uh, I was struck recently when I uh, read the news that uh, David Petraeus said the Congress was arguing for uh, sub uh, the U.S. support of Al-Qaeda in Syria. Uh, really, Jabhat al-Nusra, which is the yes. local uh, branch of Al-Qaeda. Uh, but now, given your uh, figures on the last slide, uh, it, uh, it makes perfect sense, you know, ISIS, 36%, Al-Qaeda, only 5%. Right. So, uh... It's from June of this year. So, uh, it shows that, I guess, the, the media has a tremendous short-term effect on the, on the public mindset as, uh, you know, uh, of course, the Al-Qaeda was behind the 9-11, but it is not perceived anymore as a as a threat compared to to what the buzz is, and the buzz is of course ISIS and yes. maybe China. Yeah. Yeah. So, so quite amazing. This is something to study. Do you have any other questions? So maybe we can collect all the questions from St. Petersburg and then go to Moscow. Uh, yes, the uh, uh, St. Petersburg. Just another question. Uh, so you talking primarily about TV news, but mm -hmm. I'm wondering what about not TV news, but other TV content, like, I don't know, series, uh, movies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, quite a lot of them now have uh, Islamist terrorists as uh, mm -hmm. main characters, like the Homeland series, which, which was awarded uh, mm -hmm. the Emmy the last year or one year ago, and so on. So, uh, mm -hmm. to what extent is complement to, you know, to TV news with it, like short term uh, uh, That's a great question, as, as uh, I'm also interested in entertainment, but I don't get to study it enough. Um, uh, two thoughts on that. That's a, that's a really good point. Um, one, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, uh, prior to 9 11, most representations were in series or TV movies, like you mentioned, about terrorism, uh, uh, Muslims, uh, Islamic terrorists were in that context. Uh, occasionally, it'll pop up about news about Israel, but that was where most people would be exposed to this type of, of portrayals and cues. After 9/11, that switched, uh, where entertainment became sort of a, a drop in the bucket compared to the 24-hour news cycle and the amount of news coverage uh, day in and day out about invasion of Iraq, uh, homeland security, our terrorism threat warnings. Um, and where what you saw was that these shows like Homeland and some other entertainment, they, yes, they're prevalent and they're popular, but compared to the daily, day in, you know, you know, Homeland might be one season of like 12 episodes where versus every day seeing 24-hour news coverage of terrorism on cable news, right? So just the pure amount of information, pure amount of cues from news, sort of overwhelms anything that might be independently contributed by entertainment. I will say, though, that when there are some studies that looked at entertainment and torture, that a lot of these shows, like 24, um, where they would use torture, and they would show that torture is a very effective means of collecting information, 
there has been some research that um, they don't show torture in news, and they don't talk about torture in news. It might be enhanced interrogation at best, but um, they don't use that word. But in the entertainment, uh, showing that how people feel about torture and torturing of terrorism suspects, regardless of race, um, has been influenced about the degree of uh, entertainment depictions in both movies and TV about torture. I also will say that these other shows like Homeland Security only merely reinforce many of the narratives that are found day in and day out in TV news. So they might show a reinforcing function with TV news, or in some ways focus, uh, have their own independent effects, not so much about terrorism or Muslims per se, but other aspects of conflict like the efficacy of torture. Do you have any other questions? Uh, yes, yeah, I actually also have a question. In the early part of your presentation, when you discussed the influence of Al Jazeera and uh, Al Arabiya yes. on the anti-American sentiment, uh, you found interesting interactive effects uh, that were opposite uh, uh, for Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya yeah. with uh, the Arab yes. identity. I wonder if you have an explanation of this, well, because I, we, uh, we sort of know that uh, Qatar and Saudi Arabia are sort of similar, although sometimes they have small fights, but generally they do not differ that much. Actually, they differ a great deal, actually, in their politics. Um, uh, uh, you know, they are on different sides of the Arab Spring, for example. Al Jazeera heavily promoted the Arab Spring in Tunisia, and in Egypt, Al Arabiya did not. All right, Al Arabiya has been much more friendlier towards U.S. The the number of U.S. Uh, spokespeople from the State Department, from other agencies, um, Al Arabiya uh, dwarfs anything in Al Jazeera. Um, so they give a lot more airtime to um, U.S. policy frames on Al Arabiya. There's lots of research on significant content differences based upon they have very different politics of those two countries in terms of how they view U.S. relations as well as they view the stability of certain regimes in the region. There's actually a lot of research, international relations research and other research on how these two channels in many ways are a proxy fight between these two regimes for influence in the region representing their different sort of where uh, Qatar is focused on regime change and uh, uh, versus uh, Saudi Arabia is focused on regime stability. They don't want change. And so they have different uh, political philosophies, different regional politics, and very different approaches to uh, communicating and portraying the United States. Um, that has changed a little bit where Al, Jaz Al Jazeera has softened its focus towards the United States a little bit, especially as we withdrew from uh, Iraq. The same basic pattern still exists. Okay, Moscow, now it's your turn. Okay. Uh, how, do we have any questions? I have also questions. Yeah. Let's go. Uh, how you try... Can you, can you come? Uh, come uh, you, you just, okay, it's okay, don't take it. How you, uh, have you tried to uh, check potential other potential moderators such as trust in media or maybe any psychological characteristics mm -hmm. such as the level of conformism or something else in that kind? Yeah, the, the other, oh, that's a good question. I think there are other potential moderators I'm interested in. One is something called social dominance orientation, mm -hmm. which is also comes out of social psychology, which is focused on how you view the hierarchy of groups, whether you believe that all groups should be treated equally yeah. versus there's actual hierarchy of groups. And that's actually been, there's a lot of research that's looked at intergroup th threat theory and social dominance orientation together as a potential moderator on threat perceptions. So the, the, if you have a high SDO, right, as a personality trait, you're more likely to see uh, perceive intergroup threat from a stimulus than not. Um, there's actually been some research looking at social dominance orientation um, in context of how um, Arabs view Americans and Americans view Arabs. There's been a little bit of that research. Um, so that's another one. Uh, the strength, the, the, when you talk about identity, you can talk about the salience of identity, the accessibility of identity, as well as the centrality of identity, the importance of that identity. So we all have different identities. Uh, I'm American, I might be white, I might be male. Um, there are different social identities. I might be a Democrat, a Republican, an American. So, you know, the idea that different social identities, their salience varies by context. 
or by stimulus. Uh, media, I have a paper that shows how media can influence uh, what identity must be, may, may be most salient to you. Um, but you also have the centrality. Not only do you have salience of identity, it's how strongly you feel attached to that identity, right? So there's two dimensions to identity research, social identity research. And so I've been thinking, you know, and you can measure them separately as two different factors. You can put them together as one factor. But regardless, my thought is that how the strength of your identity, much like I showed in the first study, I looked at identity uh, and how it moderated media effects among uh, Arab viewers. I thought about looking at American viewers and their strength of their American identity or maybe their patriotic identity and how that might influence uh, their, their uh, consumption and response to terrorism news. So identity and social dominance orientation are two areas I'm interested in. Any other questions? Yeah, I have also several questions. Oh, please. Uh, unfortunately, you, you didn't have much time to or tell us precisely about the methodology of each project. But, sure. Uh, still, I, I didn't actually get uh, how you did the survey in the following countries. Did, do you have any... Oh, the, the, the have Arab any, countries? Yes. Do you have any obstacles uh, from right. government? So how do you get their permission? It is right. So that data was actually an analysis of secondary data. So I didn't collect that data. That was collected by the University of Maryland. I think maybe because the slide was messed up, they didn't show. So the University of Maryland collected that data. It has been collecting that data for several years. Um, they have they had a more recent one since the, we published that paper in 2011. I actually I collaborated with them a little bit and put some additional measures on it, where they've been collecting data on Arab public opinion and media use and foreign policy attitudes for several and how years. You, how you basically, uh, uh, this was the first yeah. part of my question, but how basically they can they control or you control which channels people are watching because it's uh, all the channels available. So right. So you, you can, basically you, you can ask yeah oh, open it yeah you have a, a so here, so you can, so they you have watch, they have a long list of channels um, though they have when you look at uh, there's a wide range of satellite channels Al Jazeera by far about half of Arabs across any survey say that Al Jazeera is the number one news source. Um, Al Arabiya maybe has maybe 15, 20 percent. It's, it's a smaller uh, audience share. But they asked basically, we had measures in the survey, uh, 23 different channels. But after a while, you know, people usually rely on two, three, four channels. They're not for news. They're not watching 20 different channels for news. Um, so they're asked what news channels they watch. And now we, did, we also controlled for self-selection bias. So in, in media studies, often there's, there's an endogeneity issue, causality issue, because you know, the idea is, am I conservative because I watch Fox News, mm -hmm. or am I, if I watch Fox News unless I'm conservative? Uh, in that particular survey, what, were, what was the nice thing they did is that not only did they asked what was their number, what was the TV channel they would always go to first for international news, what TV channel would they go to second, third, so they asked some ranking of what TV channels they would, so their ranking of self-selection, mm -hmm. but regardless of what they ranked, they also looked at exposure. So even if they picked Al Jazeera third as their TV channel, they, we still could look at the exposure of Al Jazeera controlling for whether it's your first choice, second choice, third choice. So we had both variables in there, and what we're looking at is not that choice, but actual exposure above and beyond self-selection effects. And also, uh, just I wanted to continue to Edward's question yeah. about this uh, different direction effect yeah. and influence. Actually, you mentioned that for most Muslim identity, it was negative. For Arab identity, it was positive. No effect for Muslim identity. Uh, I think in uh, okay. for we go back. So and I thought, how come it can have different direction? Depends on the identity because the what what identity does. Yeah, but, I mean the news basically process. they have the they have influence in one direction. I mean for in some people in a different direction for others. And how much different than the identity of Arab from identity of Muslim and very different. Politically, historically, um, Arab nationalism is very differentiated between between uh, Islamic nationalism. Though it's been eclipsed. Uh, I mean, you, that's what the Pan-Arab Republic, when you had the aborted union between Syria and Egypt historically, um, that you know you have a long history of Arab nationalism. But basically, because of the growth of repressive regimes, um, where only political activity could take place in mosques, uh, other type of political dialogue was often sort of pu public deliberation was restricted. Uh, that's one reason uh, Islamic political identity became so popular as a means of mobilization and identification in many different countries. Um, Pan-Arab identity has gone down, so it's a much smaller percentage of the population. Um, 
But you know, identity uh, uh, schemas are highly influential on how you inf uh, process information from a social psychological perspective. Um, you could look at the same information, completely unbiased and perceive completely two different things from the same media. It's called the hostile media effect, actually. There's a lot of research on that. Um, as actually, the first paper was 1986, based upon a study between Jews and Palestinians, where they looked at uh, media coverage of how of uh, conflict in Lebanon had the exact same news broadcast, and you had people who were strongly identified as Jewish versus strongly identified as Palestinian, and they believed that the, and they believed that the news was, was biased against them. Even though it was, you know, they it was uh, they saw the same news broadcast. So, uh, your strength of identity can influence uh, what information you pay attention to, what information you know, selective perception, uh, what information you pay attention to, what inf how you process the information, um, how what information you recall, um, and uh, how you interpret that information. And so that's why you see it's a combination of the two. They have certain identities that tend to, uh, and, and uh, might be more open to informational effects, because they don't have their, their attitudes towards the United States are not hardened. So you have, like, for example, people who identify strongly as Muslim, they are highly unfavorable to the United States. No matter what you tell them, or what you show them, they're going to have an unfavorable attitude towards the United States, and you have ceiling effects. They only can be so unfavorable, right? So, you know, they only can, you know, dislike the United States so much. So even if you tell them more, they're not going to dislike you more. You'd be a hit a ceiling. Um, then with uh, and then what we found was that the people who had a national identity or an Arab identity were more open to informational effects, depending on the valence of the content to which they're exposed. And there, are, and in our paper, full paper, we talk about the important differences between the content of Al Arabiya versus the content of Al Jazeera when it comes to the portrayal of the United States. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's okay. completely not clear. <laughs> And uh, I have actually the last question. Okay, I, no problem. I'm here. I'm here. So, Came uh, along the way. Basically, I was thinking about, you were talking about the mass media effect, uh, about the crime rates and uh, yeah, the United States. And, and the, uh, racial um, attitudes, uh, yeah. and actually. Yeah. I was thinking about, in case you can put the real statistics, uh, do actually mass media have ground for uh, Translate, translating or transforming all this and use. No, I mean, them. most criminals are, are white. So, okay. So because 80% of the population is white. So, <laughs> disproportionately, you know, um, most crimes are conducted and by white people. What is the reason for that? Why is the reason why they focus on African Americans? Um, because often uh, uh, the crime might happen in poor neighborhoods, so it's easier to cover. Um, uh, it's, uh, I mean, the reasons why they're disproportionate. Um, in the United States, if it bleeds, it leads, is, is the mantra in journalism. And often, local news especially, when there's any type of violent crime, will look around for violent crime. So if it's not in their own like, city, they'll report violent crime from other cities just so it's on the first lead, because that's what people are interested in. And so that creates an over-representation. Um, and also, it, you find, for one reason or another, often the race of the perpetrators more often mentioned where the crime is conducted by an African-American than racism mentioned because of white. Because in the minds of journalists, it's a, it's, it, because African-Americans are a minority, it's relevant that they're African-American. Since whites are the majority and they conduct a majority of crimes, why is it newsworthy that the person was white? Right? So, because, you know, it's the idea is that since a lower proportion is conducted by, but that means can whenever it, they see the news. Can it be the relation because of the uh, race of the journalists themselves? It could be. I mean, there's a wide range of issues where there might be bias, and there's some studies that looked at the race of the journalist. Um, people's own racial attitudes will often play, play a role. I mean, there's a, it's a, there's a, I mean, in the, it's a very complex sort of process of both probably sociological and psychological of why you see bias in news, racial bias in news. Um, there's a lot of journalistic um, norms that sometimes unintentionally lead to bias. Uh, false balance, for example, um, for one reason or another. Um, a uh, journalistic editors who focus on, the journalist turns in a, I mean, we, we have a journalism school in my program, so I, I deal with this all the time, talking to journalism students. I don't teach journalism classes, I'm not a journalist by training at all, but I do teach some classes, I have journalism students in them. 
and um, you know, talking about how their articles are being edited by their editors, often in some ways that might be uh, inaccurate or not really uh, as accurate as they should be because editors think it would be a better news story, more likely to get people to read it. So there's a whole wide range of, it's a whole another can of worms to open up. Thank you. Any other sure. questions? Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. Uh, we know that in the transitioning economies, uh, medias are controlled by the government or even owned by the government. Yeah. To what extent do developed democracies in the U.S. in particular do you think the media is independent when portraying um, sensitive information mm -hmm. issues or if are interested by the government, maybe military stuff? Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's complex. Sometimes there's um, unintentional bias in favor of the government. Um, I'm not sure if familiar with uh, familiar with Lance Bennett's work. He's a um, media sociologist in the United States who studied a lot around how media covers, and it's usually around things like uh, international conflict. We see a lot of media bias in favor of the government, especially like terrorism policy, um, things like torture, um, things that deal with state power. Even in uh, democratic countries like the United States, which are most where the media by far is privately owned because of journalistic norms in terms of how they give deference to uh, political leaders, the government, how often they have to rely on the government as sources of information because they can't get a source of information otherwise. Because of government media relations and press relations, there is often not necessarily intentional subservience or intentional um, uh, bias towards sort of pro-government frames or pro-government uh, messaging, but often unintentional sort of bias that, that, that influences how the media covers issues like terrorism or international conflict. Um, and, you know, I recommend reading uh, Lance Bennett's work on indexing. Um, there's a great documentary by Bill Moyers, who is a, a liberal progressive documentarian, which for our PBS, he's a famous journalist as well, I mean, more of a journalist. It's called Buying the War, and I show it to my students when I show talk about uh, international uh, communication about how the the basically the Bush administration manipulated the media or influenced the media to a great degree when it came to the idea that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. So there are uh, it's it's a very complex process, and part of it is media relations on the government part. Part of it is sort of the journalistic economic biases of a um, privatized media that is concerned more about ratings and advertising and than not so actually getting accurate information combined with the idea that they don't want to be seen out on a limb, that because they rely upon ratings and advertising, they can't be seen sometimes, especially when there's the go against public opinion. So it's hard for them to necessarily be independent public opinion sometimes because they want to be seen as too sort of out on the limb. Thanks. Right? Sure. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> whether it was uh, an effect of uh, uh, re Republican or Democratic TV channels on uh, reproducing of racial uh, stereotypes? No, no, because most of the stuff is on local TV news, which is not Republican or Democrat. It's not cable news. It's it's just local. You're local in Columbus, Ohio, where OSU is. We have lo every major city has local TV news, uh -huh. right? Locally produced, locally owned TV news, maybe. And so um, that is the for plurality of Americans. Half an hour at eleven o'clock is your local news. Eleven, mm -hmm. you know. So you have your national news at 6 p.m., your local news at 6.30, no, local news at 6, national news at 6.30, and then you again have local news at 11. So it's that half an hour local news where uh, there's two components to it. About two-thirds of it is disaster, accidents, or crime, and the other third is sports. <laughs> and maybe occasionally some other public affairs in there, or, or scandal or corruption. Right, it's, it's, it's horrible. And there's been all kinds of reasons showing how local TV news influences fear of crime in general. It's not even racially, crime in general, racial attitudes. It's a horrible source of news, but for most Americans, especially older Americans, are primary source of news. Okay, Dale. Thanks. Sure. Any other questions? Uh, do you have any questions from St. Petersburg, Mo? Uh, no. We yeah. oh. uh, we we enjoyed it, but no more questions. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but go home. It was very good, thank you. Yeah, it was excellent. Oh thank well, thank so you. Much. It was my pleasure. I thank you for the great questions, and I'm glad to actually present this to an international audience. It's really fascinating for me. So thank you very much. I enjoyed myself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.